All over the world, we are witnessing an outbreak of abominable anti-Semitism. Reports of these incidents have been heard to some extent on the media, but I have seen more reports on social media and even heard personal stories. Rather than taking a firm stand to stomp it out, little is being done to eradicate it. Even Western governments, who in some cases may have made some bold statements, in practice have done little to stimmy it. The media has fanned the flames of these often violent demonstrations with inflammatory, distorted reports. 155 years ago, before political Zionism and before the return of the Jews in 1868, the Christadelphian author John Thomas wrote the book now known as Exposition of Daniel. John Thomas commented on the time just before the return of Christ. He wrote, The time, however, fast approaches. And the nearer it arrives, the more important do all questions become, bearing upon Judah's land and Zion, the city of their king. This is pretty incredible that someone 155 years ago could understand from the Bible that the closer we are to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the more important will be the issue of Judah's land and Zion. Zion, or the city of Jerusalem. And how important are those questions today? Well, here's a question that is generating a lot of discussion today. Are Hamas terrorists? This seems like a very simple question. The logical answer is yes. In fact, a number of nations do hold Hamas as a terror organization. What is a terrorist? The dictionary says, A person who engages in terrorism one who favors or uses terrorizing methods for the accomplishment of some object, as for coercing a government or a community, a person, group, or organization that uses violent action or the threat of violent action to further political goals. So are Hamas terrorists? The logical answer by definition is clearly yes. In fact, a number of nations do hold Hamas as a terror organization. There is no question that the attacks on Israeli civilians on October the 7th were terrorist attacks, and not just terrorist attacks, but terrorist attacks of an obscene level and type of brutality, a massacre of the elderly, babies targeted at close range. In fact, the stories were so horrific that whichever words are used to describe them, would themselves be forever defiled. Yet, on October the 11th, an article in the National Post in Canada reported that Canada's national news outlet, CBC, in a leaked memo, communicated to journalists to not call Hamas terrorists. The National Post reported, a leaked mem memo from the CBC tells its journalists to avoid use of the word terrorist when referring to Hamas fighters in its coverage of the ongoing war in Israel and the Gaza Strip. The article continued, Do not refer to militants, soldiers, or anyone else as terrorists, the memo states, emphasizing do not with bold type. The notion of terrorism remains heavily politicized and is part of the story. Even when quoting clipping a government or a source referring to fighters as terrorists, we should add context to ensure the audience understands this is opinion, not fact. That includes statements from the Canadian government and Canadian politicians. Meanwhile, in the UK, on October 10th, it was reported in the Telegraph that the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, confronts BBC live on air for failing to call Hamas terrorists. The article says the BBC has been describing Hamas as fighters, militants, or political resistance, as its guidelines state that journalists should not call the attacks on Israel terrorism. In another article on the Telegraph, it notes that Grant Shapps, the Defense Secretary, said it was time for the BBC to get the moral compass out and suggested it was disgraceful for the news organization not to describe Hamas as terrorists. He said, 
They are not freedom fighters. They are not militants. They are pure and simple terrorists. And it's remarkable to go to the BBC website and still see them talking about gunmen and militants and not calling them terrorists. I don't know what's going on on there, but I think it's time to get the moral compass out at the BBC. Meanwhile, John Simpson, a veteran correspondent who is currently World Affairs Editor at the BBC, said in response, The BBC's job is to place the facts before its audience and let them decide what they think, honestly and without ranting. Well, isn't it a fact that a group who regularly engages in terrorist activity perpetrated a horrific number of terrorist attacks in Israel on October the 7th are terrorists? This group is by every definition terrorists, so why not call them such? The headline in the Telegraph gives the answer. John Simpson says BBC would be taking sides if it described Hamas as terrorists. So even though Hamas are terrorists by de definition, the BBC will not call them such in order to remain impartial between the terrorists and their victims. What the BBC is saying, in effect, is that they will not call Hamas terrorists because, well, they could be justified in their attack. The Washington Post and the Associated Press have similar guidelines. The word terrorist is being erased from news reporting because these violent attacks against innocent civilians could be justified. Kirk Lapointe, CBC's ombudsman, wrote, I think CBC pursues the correct approach. Its language is descriptive, but not subjective or judgmental. Its moral reasoning views those rather too qualities as the domain of the audience. It is astounding that the mainstream media outlets around the world refuse to call Hamas terrorists, which is by every definition a terrorist organization, so as not to be subjective or judgmental. In reality, calling Hamas a terrorist organization is simply reporting the facts. Hamas are terrorists. This is a fact. An opinion piece on the UK Telegraph on November 19th is entitled BBC's credibility with Jewish community has reached breaking point. Here, some, here are some excerpts from the piece by Danny Cohen. The BBC's credibility with the Jewish community is reaching a point of no return. On a daily basis, Britain's Jews are being harmed through its unbalanced reporting of the Israel-Hamas war and the failure of its senior management to get to grips with it. The problem started almost as soon as Hamas began its horrific acts, attacks on October 7th. The BBC's unwillingness to describe the burning alive of families in their homes, the rape of women, and the murder of babies as a terrorist attack is now well known and stands in stark contrast with its reporting of other recent terrorist incidents. If it were possible, the BBC's description of these massacres has actually become more egregious. BBC News has since described the pogrom of October the 7th as a cross-border attack, as if it were a skirmish between two warring armies, rather than the worst massacre of Jewish families since the Holocaust. It's hard to find words to describe both how offensive and how reductionist this is. It makes me wonder whether any senior member of BBC management could look the families of October the 7th massacres in the eyes and tell them that they believe this is an appropriate description for the slaughter of innocent civilians and the kidnapping of children. Unfortunately, this is not an isolated incident. The BBC's anti-Israel bias spans both its UK and global outlook and its broadcasting and online presence. Examples of this could fill pages and many have been reported. Sadly, there is so much more. The BBC's diplomatic correspondent, Caroline Hawley, appears to have no interest in balance when it comes to Israel and the Hamas attacks. Her Twitter feed reads like a series of press releases from Hamas Central Command. 
Day after day, Holly reposts messages and photographs from Gaza without context or any apparent attempt at basic journalistic verification. There is barely a mention of the October 7th massacres or the ongoing plight of the Israeli hostages held by Hamas. Journalists who are terrorists. An expose by Honest Reporting has shown that journalists were embedded with the terrorists on October 7th. These journalists were there with the terrorists when they breached the fence into Israel. How did they know of this surprise attack? These independent journalists work for the likes of CNN, the New York Times, the Associated Press, and Reuters, some of the largest news organizations in the world. A picture of one of these journalists has emerged of him embracing Ham the Hamas leader and mastermind of the October 7th attacks, Yaha Sinwar. One of the images sh showed a lynch mob brutalizing the body of an Israeli soldier who was dragged out of a tank. It was labeled as one of the images of the day by Ro Reuters. These journalists were embedded with and double as terrorists. After the expose by Honest Reporting, CNN cut ties with one of these journalists, as reported by the Daily Wire. However, CNN said, while we have not at this time found reason to doubt the journalistic accuracy of the work he has done for us, we have decided to s suspend all ties with him. Journalistic accuracy from these people? How can we trust the media to f to report the facts? Hamas has popularized the, sl the slogan, Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. This, of course, necessitates the complete erasure of the Jewish people from the land of Israel. It is a slogan of the genocide of the Jewish people in the land. God has other plans. Speaking of the restored kingdom of Israel, Psalm 72 verse 8 says, He shall have dominion from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. The kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ will extend from the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea, and to quote Genesis, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Why is there so much anti-Semitism and bias in the media against the Jewish people and their nation Israel? The Bible provides the answer. Revelation 16 is a prophecy for our time, the time of the end. When the vision speaks specifically of the final days before the return of the Lord Jesus, it focuses on unclean teaching, spirits, going out into the world. This information, philosophy, or teaching, gathers the nations to war against the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 16, verses 13 through 16 read, and I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. The dragon, beast, and false prophet are symbols which depict the latter-day secular and religious powers, powers which are descended from the Eastern and Western Roman empires. In other words, the European Union, Russia, and the Vatican, the Roman Church, and the Greek Orthodox Church. Out of the mouths of these powers have come teachings which have gone out into the world to deceive the people. The result of this great deception will bring the nations of the world to war against the Lord Jesus Christ in a Hebrew place. We know clearly from the Hebrew prophets that this is against the restored nation of Israel, Joel 3 and Ezekiel 38, for example. We could say it is an anti-Semitic invasion. At the basis of the conflict is the Roman Church's ideological opposition to the return of the Jews and their sovereignty over the so-called holy sites in the land of Israel. In fact, the very presence of the restored Jewish nation challenges the Roman Church's doctrine that they are the kingdom of God. 
Of course, the Vatican has had a few things to say about the situation in Israel. In the National Catholic Register, there was an article, Vatican Call for Peace in the Holy Land Offers to Mediate Between Hamas and Israel. The Vatican condemned the terrorist attacks against Israel. And then the article read, I do know how much I... I do not know how much room for dialogue there can be between Israel and the Hamas militia, Cardinal Parolin said. But if there is, and we hope there is, it should be pursued immediately and without delay. After speaking of the two-state solution as the greatest possible justice in the Holy Land, the Cardinal said, However, any mediation to end the conflict must take into account a series of elements that make the issue very complex and articulated, such as the issue of Israeli settlements, security, and the issue of the city of Jerusalem. We know from long-standing positions of the Vatican that they believe Israeli settlements in the biblical heartland must be destroyed and the city of Jerusalem and the holy places must be internationalized, in other words, under Vatican control. Let's summarize the Vatican position. 1. Israel should negotiate as soon as possible with the terrorist group Hamas, which they call a militia, which has just perpetrated an attack worse than ISIS on Israeli civilians. 2. Israel should allow the creation of a Palestinian Arab state on their land. This would be the greatest possible justice. 3. Israel should abandon, i.e. destroy, their communities in the West Bank and turn the city of Jerusalem over to international control. In his work Eureka, referring to Revelation 16 and the Sixth Vial, John Thomas wrote, To abolish the Greek and Latin superstitions in Jerusalem would set the frogs into violent activity, inflame the 200 millions of European papists with burning fanaticism, and throw the autocrat of all the rushes into fierce and furious paroxysms of wrath. We see the prelude to this today, with distorted reporting fanning the flames of violent anti-Semitic activity across the globe. These verses in Revelation 16 have a great warning for us, a warning to not be deceived as we live in an age of deception. We are being warned by the Lord Jesus not to believe the media, the mouthpiece of world governments, not to believe what we hear, not to be deceived. There is a great danger if we allow the mass media to shape our opinion of these events. Before long, we may begin to speak less about the hope of Israel. We may not want to speak about the restored kingdom of Israel to our friends or include it in our preaching. In doing so, we would not be preaching the gospel properly. Many years ago, John Thomas, in his book, Elpis Israel, The Hope of Israel, wrote, It is clear that to preach the kingdom is to preach the gospel, and to preach the gospel is to preach the kingdom of God. This is a most important demonstration, for it enables us to determine when we hear the gospel. The gospel is not preached when the things of the kingdom are omitted, and this is one grand defect in modern preaching. So let us be aware that we live in an age of deception. Let us question everything we hear on the mass media and social media. Finally, let us preach the gospel of the restoration of the kingdom of Israel with all confidence. Thanks for listening to Bible in the News. Please come back next week to www.bibleinthenews.com. This has been David Billington with you.